Chapter 6, The Overpaid Maid Some days later, Bruno was lying on the bed in his room, staring at the ceiling above his head. The white paint was cracked and peeling away from itself in a most unpleasant manner, unlike the paintwork in the house in Berlin, which was never chipped and received an annual top-up every summer when Mother brought the decorators in. On this particular afternoon, he lay there and stared at the spidery cracks, narrowing his eyes to consider what might lie behind them. He imagined that there were insects living in the spaces between the paint and the ceiling itself, which was pushing it out, cracking it wide, opening it up, trying to create a gap so that they could squeeze through and look for a window where they might make their escape. Nothing, thought Bruno, not even the insects would ever choose to stay it out with. Everything here is horrible, he said out loud, even though there was no one present to hear him. But somehow it made him feel better to hear the words stated anyway. I hate this house, I hate my room, and I even hate the paintwork. I hate it all, absolutely everything. Just as he finished speaking, Maria came through the door carrying an armful of his washed, dried, and iron clothes. She hesitated for a moment when she saw him lying there, but then bowed her head a little and walked silently over towards the wardrobe. Hello, said Bruno, for although talking to a maid wasn't quite the same thing as having some friends to talk to, there was no one else around to have a conversation with, and it made much more sense than talking to himself. Gretel was nowhere to be found, and he had begun to worry he would go mad with boredom. Master Bruno, said Maria quietly, separating his vest from his trousers and his underwear and putting them in different drawers and on different shelves. I expect you're as unhappy about this new arrangement as I am, said Bruno, and she turned to look at him with an expression that suggested she didn't understand what he meant. This, he explained, sitting up and looking around, everything here. It's awful, isn't it? Don't you hate it, too? Maria opened her mouth to say something, and then closed it again just as quickly. She seemed to be considering her response carefully, selecting the right words, preparing to say them, and then thinking better of it and discarding them altogether. Bruno had known her for almost his entire life. She had come to work for them when he was only three years old, and they had got along quite well for the most part, but she had never showed any particular signs of life before. She just got on with her job, polishing the furniture, washing the clothes, helping with the shopping and the cooking, sometimes taking him to school and collecting him again, although that had been more common when Bruno was eight. When he turned nine, he decided he was old enough to make his way there and home alone. "'Don't you like it here, then?' she said finally." Like it, replied Bruno with a slight laugh. Like it, he repeated, but louder this time. Of course I don't like it. It's awful. There's nothing to do. There's no one to talk to, nobody to play with. You can't tell me you're happy we've moved here, surely. I always enjoyed the garden at the house in Berlin, said Maria, answering an entirely different question. Sometimes when it was a warm afternoon, I liked to sit out there in the sunshine and eat my lunch underneath the ivy tree by the pond. The flowers were very beautiful there. Thence the way the bees hovered around them and never bothered you if you just left them alone. So you don't like it here then, said Bruno. You think it's as bad as I do. Maria frowned. It's not important, she said. What isn't? What I think. Well, of course it's important, said Bruno irritably, as if she was just being deliberately difficult. You're part of the family, aren't you? I'm not sure whether your father would agree with that, said Maria, allowing herself a smile because she was touched by what he had just said. Well, you've been brought here against your will, just like I have. If you ask me, we're all in the same boat, and it's leaking. For a moment, it seemed to Bruno as if Maria was really going to tell him what she was thinking. She laid the rest of his clothes down on the bed, and her hands clenched into fists, as if she was terribly angry about something. Her mouth opened, but froze there for a moment, as if she was scared of all the things she might say if she allowed herself to begin. Please tell me, Maria, said Bruno, because maybe if we all feel the same way, we can persuade Father to take us home again. She looked away from him for a few silent moments and shook her head sadly before turning back to face him. Your father knows what is for the best, she said. You must trust in that. But I'm not sure I do, said Bruno. I think he's made a terrible mistake. Then it's a mistake we all have to live with. When I mis make mistakes, I get punished, insisted Bruno, irritated by the fact that the rules always applied to children never seemed to apply to grown-ups at all, despite the fact that they were the ones who enforced them. Stupid father, he added under his breath. Maria's eyes opened wide, and she took a step towards him, her hands covering her mouth for a moment in horror. She looked round to make sure that no one was listening to them and had heard what Bruno had just said. "'You mustn't say that,' she said. "'You must never say something like that about your father.' "'I don't see why not,' said Bruno. He was a little ashamed of himself for having said it, but the last thing he was going to do was sit back and receive a telling off when no one seemed to care about his opinions anyway. "'Because your father is a very good man,' said Maria. "'A very good man. He takes care of all of us.' Bringing us all the way out here to the middle of nowhere, you mean. Is that taking care of us? There are many things your father's done, she said. 
Many things of which you should be proud. If it wasn't for your father, where would I be now, after all? Back in Berlin, I expect, said Bruno, working in a nice house, eating your lunch underneath the ivy, and leaving the bees alone. You don't remember when I came to work for your family, do you? She asked quietly, sitting down for a moment on the side of his bed, something she had never done before. How could you? You were only three. Your father took me in and helped me when I needed him. He gave me a job, a home, food. You can't imagine what it's like to need food. You've never been hungry, have you? Bruno frowned. He wanted to mention that he was feeling a bit peckish right now, but instead he looked across at Maria and realized for the first time he had never fully considered her to be a person with a life and a history all of her own. After all, she had never done anything, as far as he knew, other than be his family's maid. He wasn't even sure he had ever seen her dressed in anything other than her maid's uniform. But when he came to think of it, as he did now, he had to admit that there must be more to her life than just waiting on him and his family. She must have thoughts in her head, just like him. She must have things that she missed, friends whom she wanted to see again, just like him. And she must have cried herself to sleep every night since she got here, just like boys far less grown up and brave than him. She was rather pretty, too, he noticed, feeling a little funny inside as he did so. My mother knew your father when he was just a boy of your age, said Maria, after a few moments. She worked for your grandmother. She was a dresser for her when she toured Germany as a younger woman. She arranged all the clothes for her concerts, washed them, ironed them, repaired them. Magnificent gowns, all of them. And the stitching, Bruno, like artwork, every design. You don't find dressmakers like that these days. She shook her head and smiled at the memory as Bruno listened patiently. She made sure that they were all laid out and ready whenever your grandmother arrived in her dressing room before a show. And after your grandmother retired, of course my mother stayed friendly with her and received a small pension. But times were hard then, and your father offered me a job, the first I had ever had. A few months later, my mother became very sick, and she needed a lot of hospital care, and your father arranged it all, even though he was not obliged to. He paid for it out of his own pocket because she had been a friend to his mother, and she took, he took me into this household for the same reason. And when she died, he paid all of the expenses for her funeral, too. So don't you ever call your father stupid Bruno. Not a mount round me. I won't allow it. Bruno bit his lip. He had hoped that Maria would take his side in the campaign to get away from Outwith, but he could see where her loyalties really lay. And he had to admit he was rather proud of his father when he heard that story. Well, he said, unable to think of something clever to say now, I suppose that was nice of him. Yes, said Maria, standing up and walking over towards the window, the one through which Bruno could see all the way to the huts and the people in the distance. He was very kind to me then, she continued quietly, looking through it now herself and watching the people and the soldiers go about their business far away. He has a lot of kindness in his soul, truly he does, which makes me wonder. She drifted off as she watched them, and her voice cracked suddenly, and she sounded as if she might cry. Wonder what? asked Bruno. Wonder what he, how he can, how he can what? insisted Bruno. The noise of a door slamming came from downstairs and reverberated through the house so loudly, like a gunshot, that Bruno jumped and Maria let out a small scream. Bruno recognized footsteps pounding up the stairs toward them, quicker and quicker, and he crawled back on the bed, pressing himself against the wall, suddenly afraid of what was going to happen next. He held his breath, expecting trouble, but it was only Gretel, the hopeless case. She poked her head through the doorway and seemed surprised to find her brother and the family maid engaged in conversation. "'What's going on?' asked Gretel. "'Nothing,' said Bruno defensively. "'What do you want? Get out.' "'Get out yourself,' she replied, even though it was his room, and then turned to look at Maria, narrowing her eyes suspiciously as she did so. "'Run me a bath, Maria, will you?' she asked. "'Why can't you run your own bath?' snapped Bruno. "'Because she's the maid,' said Gretel, staring at him. "'But that's what she's here for.' "'That's not what she's here for,' shouted Bruno, standing up and marching over toward her. "'She's not just here to do all things for us all the time, you know, especially things we can do ourselves.' Gretel stared at him as if he had gone mad, and then looked at Maria, who shook her head quickly. "'Of course, Miss Gretel,' said Maria. "'I'll just finish tidying your brother's clothes away, and then I'll be right with you.' "'Well, don't be long,' said Gretel rudely, because unlike Bruno, she never stopped to think about the fact that Maria was a person with feelings just like hers, before marching back to her room and closing the door behind her. Maria's eyes didn't follow her, but her cheeks had taken on a pink glow. "'I still think he's made a terrible mistake,' said Bruno quietly after a few minutes." when he felt as if he wanted to apologize for his sister's behavior, but didn't know whether that was the thing, right thing to do or not. Situations like that always made Bruno feel very uncomfortable, because in his heart, he knew that there was no reason to be impolite to someone, even if they did work for you. There was such a thing as manners, after all. 
Even if you do, you mustn't say it out loud, said Maria quickly, coming towards him and looking as if she wanted to shake some sense into him. Promise me you won't. But why, he asked, frowning. I'm only saying what I feel. I'm allowed to do that, aren't I? No, she said. No, you're not. I'm not allowed to say what I feel, he repeated, incredulous. No, she insisted, her voice becoming grating now as she appealed to him. Just keep quiet about it, Bruno. Don't you know how much trouble you can cause for all of us? Bruno stared at her. There was something in her eyes, a sort of frenzied worry that he had never seen there before, and that unsettled him. Well, he muttered, standing up now and heading over toward the door, suddenly anxious to be away from her. I was only saying I didn't like it here, that's all. I was just making conversation with you while you put the clothes away. It's not like I'm planning on running away or anything, although if I did, I don't think anyone would criticize me for it. And you worry your mother and father half to death, asked Maria. Bruno, if you have any sense at all, you will stay quiet and concentrate on your schoolwork and do whatever your father tells you. We must all just keep ourselves safe until this is all over. That's what I intend to do anyway. What more can we do than that after all? It's not up to us to change things. Suddenly, and for no reason that he could think of, Brunner felt an overwhelming urge to cry. It surprised even him, and he blinked a few times very quickly so that Maria wouldn't see how he felt. Although when he caught her eye again, he thought that perhaps there must have been something strange in the air that day, because her eyes looked as if they were filling with tears too. All in all, he began to feel very awkward, so he turned his back on her and made his way to the door. "'Where are you going?' asked Maria. "'Outside,' said Bruno angrily, as if it's any of your business. He had walked out slowly, but once he left the room, he went more quickly toward the stairs and then ran down them at a great pace, suddenly feeling that as if he didn't get out of the house soon, he was going to faint away. And within a few seconds, he was outside, and he started to run up and down the driveway, eager to do something active, anything that would tire him out. In the distance, he could see the gate that led to the road, that led to the train station, that led home. But the idea of going there, the idea of running away and being left on his own without anyone at all, was even more unpleasant to him than the idea of staying. Chapter 7. How Mother Took Credit for Something She Hadn't Done Several weeks after Bruno arrived to out with his, with his family, and with no prospect of a visit on the horizon from either Carl or Daniel or Martin, he decided he'd better start to find some way to entertain himself or he would slowly go mad. Bruno had only known one person whom he considered to be mad, and that was Herr Roller, a man of about the same age as father, who lived round the corner from him back at the old house at Berlin. He was often seen walking up and down the street at all hours of the day or night, having terrible arguments with himself. Sometimes in the middle of these arguments, the dispute would get out of hand, and he would try to punch the shadow he was throwing up against the wall. From time to time, he fought so hard that he banged his fists against the brickwork, and they bled, and then he would fall onto his knees and start crying loudly and slapping his hands against his head. On a few occasions, Bruno had heard him using those words that he wasn't allowed to use, and when he did this, Bruno had to stop himself from giggling. You shouldn't laugh at poor hair roller, mother had told him one afternoon when he related the story of his latest escapade. You have no idea what he's been through in his life. He's crazy, Bruno said, twirling a finger in circles around the side of his head and whistling to indicate just how crazy he thought he was. He went up to a cat on the street the other day and invited her over for afternoon tea. What did the cat say? asked Gretel, who was making a sandwich in the corner of the kitchen. Nothing, explained Bruno. It was a cat. I mean it, Mother insisted. Franz was a very lovely young man. I knew him when I was a little girl. He was kind and thoughtful and could make his way around a dance floor like Fred Astaire. But when he suffered a ter terrible injury during the Great War, an injury to his head, and that's why he behaves like he does now. It's nothing to laugh at. You have no idea of what the young men went through back then. They're suffering. Bruno had only been six years old at the time and wasn't quite sure what Mother was referring to. It was many years ago, she explained when he asked her about it. Before you were born, Franz was one of the young men who fought for us in the trenches. Your father knew him very well back then. I believe they served together. And what happened to him? asked Bruno. It doesn't matter, said Mother. War is not a fit subject for conversation. I'm afraid we'll be spending too much time talking about it soon. That had been just over three years before they had all arrived at Outwith, and Bruno hadn't spent much time thinking about Air Roller in the meantime. But suddenly he became convinced that if he didn't do something sensible, something to put his mind to, to some use, then before he knew it, he would be wandering around the streets having fights with himself and inviting domestic animals to social occasions, too. To keep himself entertained, Bruno spent a long Saturday morning and afternoon creating a new diversion for himself. At some distance from the house, on Gretel's side and impossible to see from his own bedroom window, there was a large oak tree, one with a very wide trunk. 
a tall tree with hefty branches, strong enough to support a small boy. It looked so old that Brunner decided it must have been planted at some point in the late Middle Ages. A period he would recently been studying was finding very interesting, particularly those parts about knights who went off on adventures to foreign lands and discovered something interesting while they went there. There were only two things that Bruno needed to create his new entertainment, some rope and a tire. The rope was easy enough to find as there were bales of it in the basement of the house, and it didn't take long to do something dangerous and find a sharp knife and cut as many lengths of it as he thought he might need. He took those to the oak tree and left them on the ground for future use. The tire was another matter. On this particular morning, neither mother nor father was at home. Mother had rushed out of the house early and had taken a train to a nearby city for, a day, for the day for a change of air. While father had last been seen heading in the direction of the huts and the people in the distance outside Bruno's window. But as usual, there were many soldiers' trucks and jeeps parked near the house, and while he knew it would be impossible to steer a, steal a tire off of any of them, there was always the possibility that he could find a spare one somewhere. As he stepped outside, he saw Gretel speaking with Lieutenant Kotler, and without much enthusiasm, decided he would be the sensible person to ask. Lieutenant Kotler was the young officer whom Bruno had seen on his very first day at Outwith, the soldier who had appeared upstairs in their house and looked at him for a moment before nodding his head and continuing on his way. Bruno had seen him on many occasions since. He came in and out of the house as if he owned the place, and Father's office was clearly not out of bounds for him at all. But they hadn't spoken very often. Bruno wasn't entirely sure why, but he knew he didn't like Lieutenant Kotler. There was an atmosphere around him that made Bruno feel very cold and want to put a jumper on. Still, there was no one else to ask, so he marched over with as much confidence as he could muster to say hello. On most days, the young lieutenant looked very smart, striding around in a uniform that appeared to have been ironed while he was wearing it. His black boots always sparkled with polish, and his yellow blonde hair was parted at the side and held perfectly in place with something that made all the comb marks stand out on it, like a field that had just been tilled. Also, he wore so much cologne that you could smell him coming from quite a distance. Bruno had learned not to stand downwind of him, or he would risk fainting away. On this particular day, however, since it was a Saturday morning and was so sunny, he was not so perfectly groomed. Instead, he was wearing a white vest over his trousers, and his hair flopped down over his forehead in exhaustion. His arms were surprisingly tanned, and he had the kind of muscles that Bruno wished he had himself. He looked so much younger today that Bruno was surprised. In fact, he reminded him of the big boys at school, the ones he always steered clear of. Lieutenant Kotler was deep in conversation with Gretel, and whatever he was saying must have been terribly funny because she was laughing loudly and twirling her hair around her fingers into ringlets. Hello, said Bruno as he approached them, and Gretel looked at him irritably. What do you want? she asked. I don't want anything, snapped Bruno, glaring at her. I just came over to say hello. You'll have to forgive my younger brother, Kurt, said Gretel to Lieutenant Kotler. He's only nine, you know. Good morning, little man, said Kotler, reaching out and, quite appallingly, ruffling his hand through Bruno's hair, a gesture that made Bruno want to push him to the ground and jump up and down on his head. And what has you up and about so early on a Saturday morning? It's hardly early, said Bruno. It's almost ten o'clock. Lieutenant Kotler shrugged his shoulders. When I was your age, my mother couldn't get me out of bed until lunchtime. She said I would never grow up to be big and strong if I slept my life away. Well, she was quite wrong there, wasn't she? simpered Gretel. Bruno stared at her with dis distaste. She was putting on a silly voice that made her sound as if she hadn't a thought in her head. There was nothing Bruno wanted to do more than walk away from the two of them and have nothing to do with, it, with whatever they were discussing, but he had no choice but to put his best interest first and ask Lieutenant Kotler for the unthinkable, a favor. I wondered if I could ask you a favor, said Bruno. You can ask, said Lieutenant Kotler, which made Greta laugh again, even though it was not particularly funny. I wondered whether there were any spare tires around, continued Bruno, from one of the jeeps, perhaps, or a truck, one that you're not using. The only spare tire I have seen around here recently belongs to Sergeant Hofschneider, and he carries it around his waist, said Lieutenant Kotler, his lips forming into something that resembled a smile. That didn't make any sense at all to Bruno, but it entertained Gretel so much that she appeared to start dancing on the spot. Well, is he using it? asked Bruno. Sergeant Hofschneider, asked Lieutenant Kotler. Yes, I'm afraid so. He's very attached to his spare tire. Stop it, Kurt, said Gretel, drying her eyes. He doesn't understand you. He's only nine. Oh, will you be quiet, please, shouted Bruno, staring at his sister in irritation. It was bad enough to have to come here and ask for a favor from Lieutenant Kotler, but it only made things worse when his sister, te own sister teased him all the way through it. You're only 12 anyway, he added, so stop pretending to be older than you are. I'm nearly 13, Kurt, she snapped. 
Her laughter stopped now, her face, face frozen in horror. I'll be 13 in a couple weeks' time, a teenager, just like you. Lieutenant Cotler smiled and nodded his head, but said nothing. Bruno stared at him. If it had been any other adult standing in front of him, he would have rolled his eyes to suggest that they both knew girls were silly, and sisters utterly ridiculous. But this wasn't any other adult. This was Lieutenant Cotler. Anyway, said Bruno, ignoring the look of anger that Gretel was directing towards him. Other than that one, is there anywhere else I could find a spare tire? Of course, said Lieutenant Cotler, who had stopped smiling now and seemed suddenly bored with the entire thing. But what do you want it for, anyway? I thought I'd make a swing, said Bruno, you know, with a tire and some rope on the branches of a tree. Indeed, said Lieutenant Cotler, nodding his head wisely, as if such things were only distant memories to him now, despite the fact that he was, as Gretel had pointed out, no more than a teenager himself. Yes, I made many swings myself when I was a child. My friends and I had many happy afternoons playing together on them. Bruno felt astonished that he could have had anything in common with him, and even more surprised to learn that Lieutenant Cotler had ad ever had friends. So what do you think, he asked. Are there any around? Lieutenant Cotler stared at him and seemed to be considering it, as if he wasn't sure whether he was going to give him a straight answer or try to irritate him as he usually did. Then he caught sight of Pavel, the old man who came in every afternoon to help peel the vegetables in the kitchen for dinner before putting his white jacket on and serving at the table. Heading toward the house, and this seemed to make his mind up. Hey, you, he shouted, then added a word that Bruno did not understand. Come on over here, you. He said the word again, and something about the harsh sound of it made Bruno look away and feel ashamed to even be part of this at all. Pavel came towards them, and Kotler spoke to him again insolently, despite the fact that he was young enough to be his grandson. Take this little man to the storage shed at the back of the main house. Lined up along the side of the wall are some old tires. He will select one, and you are to carry it wherever he asks you. Is that understood? Pavel held his cap before him in his hands and nodded, which made his head bow even lower than it already was. Yes, sir, he said in a quiet voice, so quiet that he might have not even said it at all. And afterwards, when you return to the kitchen, make sure you wash your hands before touching any of the food, you filthy. Lieutenant Cotler repeated the word he had used twice already, and he spat a little as he spoke. Bruno glanced across at Gretel, who had been staring adoringly at the sunlight bouncing off Lieutenant Cotler's hair, but now, like her brother, looked a little uncomfortable. Neither of them had ever really spoken to Pavel before, but he was a very good waiter, and they, according to father, did not grow on trees. Off you go then, said Lieutenant Cotler, and Pavel turned and led the way toward the storage shed, followed by Bruno, who from time to time glanced back in the direction of his sister and the young soldier, and felt a great urge to go back there and pull Gretel away, despite the fact that she was annoying and self-centered and mean to him most of the time. That, after all, was her job. She was his sister but he hated the idea of leaving her alone with a man like Lieutenant Cotler. There really was no other way to dress it up. He was just plain nasty. The accident took place a couple of hours later, after Bruno had located a suitable tire and Pavel had dragged it to the large oak tree on Gretel's side of the house, and after Bruno had climbed up and down and up and down and up and down the trunk to try the rope securely around the branches and the tire itself. Until then, the whole operation had been a tremendous success. He had built one of those before, but back then he had had Carl and Daniel and Martin to help him with it. On this occasion, he was doing it by himself, and that made things decidedly trickier. And yet somehow he managed it, and within a few hours he was happily installed inside the center of the tire and swinging back and forth as if he did not have a care in the world, although he was ignoring the fact that it had been one of the most uncomfortable swings he had ever been on in his life. He lay flat out across the center of the tire and used him, his feet to give himself a good push off the ground. Every time the tire swung backwards, it rose in the air and narrowly avoided hitting the trunk of the tree itself, but it still came close enough for Bruno to use his feet to kick himself even faster and higher on the next swing. This worked very well until his grip on the tire slipped a little just as he kicked the tree, and before he knew it, his body was turning inside and he fell downwards, one foot still inside the rim while he landed face down on the ground beneath him with a thud. Everything went black for a moment and then came back into focus. He sat up on the ground, and just as the tire swung back and hit him in the head, he let out a yelp and moved out of its way. When he stood up, he could feel that his arm and leg were both very sore, as he had fallen heavily on them. But they weren't so sore that they might be broken. He inspected his hand, and it was covered in scratches, and when he looked at his elbow, he could see a nasty cut. His leg felt worse, though, and when he looked down at his knee, just below where his shorts ended, there was a wide gash which seemed to have been waiting for him to look at it, because at once all the attention was focused on it, it started to bleed rather badly. Oh dear, 
said Bruno out loud, staring at it and wondering what he should do next. He didn't have to wonder for long, though, because the swing that he had built was on the same side of the house as the kitchen, and Pavel, the waiter who had helped him find the tire, had been peeling potatoes while standing at the window and had seen the accident take place. When Bruno looked up again, he saw Pavel coming quickly towards him, and only when he arrived did he feel confident enough to let the woozy feeling that surrounded him take over completely. He fell a little, but didn't land on the ground this time, as Pavel scooped him up. I don't know what happened, he said. It didn't seem dangerous at all. You were going too high, said Pavel in a quiet voice that immediately made Bruno feel safe. I could see it. I thought that at any moment you were going to suffer a mischief. And I did, said Bruno. You certainly did. Pavel carried him across the lawn and back towards the house, taking him into the kitchen and settling him on one of the wooden chairs. Where's mother? asked Bruno, looking around for the first person he usually searched for when he'd had an accident. Your mother hasn't returned yet, I'm afraid, said Pavel, who was kneeling on the floor in front of him and examining the knee. I'm the only one here. What's going to happen then, said Bruno, beginning to panic slightly, an emotion that might encourage tears. I might bleed to death. Pavel gave a gentle laugh and shook his head. You're not going to bleed to death, he said, pulling a stool across and settling Bruno's leg on it. Don't move for a moment. There's a first aid box over here. Bruno watched as he moved around the kitchen, pulling the green first aid box from a cupboard and filling a small, white, small bowl with water, testing it first with his finger to make sure that it wasn't too cold. Will I need to go to hospital? asked Bruno. No, no, said Pavel when he returned to his kneeling position, dipping a dry cloth into the bowl and touching it gently to Bruno's knee, which made him wince in pain despite the fact that it wasn't really all that painful. It's only a small cut. It won't even need stitches. Bruno frowned and bit his lip nervously as Pavel cleaned the wound of blood and then held another cloth to it quite tightly for a few moments. When he pulled it away again, gently, the bleeding had stopped, and he took a small bottle of green liquid from the first aid box and dabbed it over the wound, which stung quite sharply and made Bruno say ow a few times in rapid succession. It's not that bad, said Pavel, but in a gentle and kindly voice. Don't make it worse by thinking it's more painful than it actually is. Somehow this made sense to Bruno, and he resisted the urge to say ow anymore, and when Pavel had finished applying the green liquid, he took a bandage from the first aid box and taped it to the cut. There, he said, all better, eh? Bruno nodded and felt a little ashamed of himself for not behaving as bravely as he would have liked. Thank you, he said. You're welcome, said Pavel. Now you need to stay sitting there for a few moments before you walk around on it, all right? Let the wound relax, and don't go near that swing again today. Bruno nodded and kept his legs stretched out on the stool, while Pavel went over to the sink and washed his hands carefully, even scrubbing under his nails with a wire brush, before drying them off and returning to the potatoes. "'Will you tell Mother what happened?' he asked, who had spent the last few minutes wondering whether he would be viewed as a hero for suffering an accident or a villain for building a death trap. "'I think she'll see for herself,' said Pavel, who took the carrots over to the table now and sat down opposite Bruno as he began to peel them onto an old newspaper. "'Yes, I suppose so,' said Bruno. "'Perhaps she'll want to take me to a doctor.' "'I don't think so,' said Pavel quietly. "'You never know,' said Bruno, who didn't want his accident to be dismissed quite so easily.' It was, after all, the most exciting thing that had happened to him since arriving here. It could be worse than it seems. It's not, said Pavel, who barely seemed to be listening to what Bruno was saying. The carrots were taking up so much of his attention. Well, how do you know, asked Bruno quickly, growing irritable now, despite the fact that this was the same man who had come out to pick him up off the ground and brought him in and taken care of him. You're not a doctor. Pavel stopped peeling the carrots for a moment and looked across the table at Bruno, his held, head held low, his eyes looking up, as if he was wondering what to say to such a thing. He sighed and seemed to consider it for a quite a long time before saying, Yes, I am. Bruno stared at him in surprise. This didn't make any sense to him. But you're a waiter, he said slowly, and you peeled the vegetables for dinner. How can you be a doctor, too? Young man, said Pavel, and Bruno appreciated the fact that he had the courtesy to call him young man instead of little man, as Lieutenant Cotler had. I certainly am a doctor. Just because a man glances up at the sky at night does not make him an astronomer, you know. Bruno had no idea what Pavel meant, but something about what he said made him look at him closely for the very first time. He was quite a small man, and very skinny too, with long fingers and angular features. He was older than father, but younger than grandfather, which still meant that he was quite old. And although Bruno had never laid eyes on him before coming to out with, something about his face made him believe that he had worn a beard in the past but not anymore. But I don't understand, said Bruno, wanting to get to the bottom of this. If you're a doctor, then why are you waiting on tables? Why aren't you working at a hospital somewhere? Pavel hesitated for a long time before answering, and while he did so, Bruno said nothing, 
He wasn't sure why, but he felt that the polite thing to do was to wait until Pavel was ready to speak. Before I came here, I practiced as a doctor, he said finally. Practiced, asked Bruno, who was unfamiliar with the word. Weren't you any good then? Pavel smiled. I was very good, he said. I always wanted to be a doctor, you see, from the time I was a small boy, from the time I was your age. I want to be an explorer, said Bruno quickly. I wish you luck, said Pavel. Thank you. Have you discovered anything yet? Back in our house in Berlin, there was a lot of exploring to be done, recalled Bruno. But then it was a very big house, bigger than you can possibly imagine, so there were a lot of places to explore. It's not the same here. Nothing is the same here, agreed Pavel. When did you arrive at Outwith? asked Bruno. Pavel put the carrot and the peeler down for a few moments and thought about it. I think I've always been here, he said, finally in a quiet voice. You grew up here. No, said Pavel, shaking his head. No, I didn't. But you just said... Before he could go on, Mother's voice could be heard outside. As soon as he heard her, Pavel jumped up quickly from his seat and returned to the sink with the carrots and the peeler and the newspaper full of peelings, and turned his back on Bruno, hanging his head low and not speaking again. "'What on earth happened to you?' asked Mother when she appeared in the kitchen, leaning down to examine the plaster which covered Bruno's cut. "'I made a swing and then I fell off of it,' explained Bruno, "'and then the swing hit me on the head and I nearly fainted, "'but Pavel came out and brought me in and cleaned it all up "'and put a bandage on me, and it stung very badly, but I didn't cry. "'I didn't cry once, did I, Pavel?' "'Pavel turned his head body slightly in their direction, but didn't lift his head. "'The wound has been cleaned,' he said quietly, not answering Bruno's question. "'There's nothing to worry about.' "'Go to your room, Bruno,' said Mother, who looked distinctly uncomfortable now.' But I don't argue with me, go to your room, she insisted. And Bruno stepped off the chair, putting his weight on what he decided to call his bad leg, and it hurt a little. He turned and left the room, but was still able to hear Mother saying thank you to Pavel as he walked towards the stairs. And this made Bruno very happy, because surely it was obvious to anyone that if it hadn't been for him, he would have bled to death. He heard one last thing before going upstairs, and this was Mother's last line to the waiter who had claimed to be a doctor. If the commandant asks, we'll say that I cleaned Bruno up which seemed terribly selfish to Bruno and a way for Mother to take credit for something that she hadn't done.